Okay, guys back there. Okay, okay, I think they've got me turned back on. Uh, but when we talk about raising the bar, I guess I'd like to direct this question to Lauren first and let her have first crack at it. You know, what problem are we really trying to solve? I mean, you know, what can an MLS or association do to raise the bar amongst its membership? I think the overall theme that I sense with this topic is that areas of the country and MLSs within those areas are very different. So it, this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of solution. If you have a dominant broker, obviously they're going to have a strong voice in whatever directions the organization takes. In our particular case, I think one of the responsibilities that an MLS can adopt or at least examine is what is it that we could offer in a site license, bulk pricing, that would be an advantage to everyone that we serve rather than just a certain segment. I don't know, uh, Tom, I mean, you come from a different style of MLS, and I'm just curious, how, how does that ring with, true with you? I mean, is there, you get any pushback from the brokers about adding new tools and features? Or? Pushback? Hmm. Uh, so Northwest Multiple Listing Service, is a broker-owned MLS. A lot of what we hear at this particular conference deals with Realtor Association-owned MLSs. Um, MLSs was originally started as broker-owned uh, 150 years ago and have evolved to mostly now uh, Realtor Association-owned and operated, but Northwest MLS is owned by all 2,000 of the firms that are members of the MLS, so we operate a little bit differently. Um, and we also happen to have a unique market which covers half of Washington State, 26 to 27,000 subscribers in our system, but only three brands control 50% of the actual transaction volume in our MLS. And those brands are Windermere, uh, John L. Scott, and Coldwell Banker. Um, and then the percentage of market share of other brands or firms really falls off. But if you look at the top seven or top nine brands, it's about 80% of the market. So it's really a phenomenal uh, arrangement, somewhat unique, and so since we recognize firms and franchises, that's another thing that's unique. 
we actually recognize a franchise as having membership rights in the MLS. So um, those voices do resonate and they participate in our board discussions and if they're not on our board, we actually take initiatives to those brands to vet them before we just go you know, buy the next or uh, order up the next shiny penny. It's a different process. So, so in many cases, we're, we're, we're regressively progressive. So we don't say yes to everything that everybody else is trying to do in the industry. We're very choosy. Okay, the, the, the choosy MLS. Now, uh, uh, David, <laughs> you're uh, very much involved in these you know, decisions uh, in your leadership capacity with the MLS and also as a principal in a, in a brokerage. I mean, how do you, you know, decide which hat you're wearing on a day that they're taking a vote about bringing in a, a new tool or service? What, how, how's that played out for you well, in your business? You, when you put the hat, when you represent the association, you put the hat on trying to balance the interests of the large broker and the small broker, uh, in, independent of where you situate in that, in that arena. Uh, so it's very difficult because the Las Vegas Association uh, 65 to 70 percent of all the listing inventory is controlled by what I'll define as a small as as a small broker, and so if the MLS or the association was going to raise the bar, or maybe that if they were raising the bar, they may be helping the overwhelming majority of not just brokers in numbers, but brokers that control a large amount of the listing inventory. So that that's that makes that uh, a difficult decision when you face those because the loudest brokers tend to be the largest the, the ones that control the largest number of, of members or agents and so that that makes it difficult but it's a ba it's a balancing and you just you try to start with what is the purpose of the MLS what what, what are we here uh, to do is it just cooperation and compensation is it to make the system or the process more efficient and does this tool uh, Further those goals, or are there other goals that you, you know you're facing? Now, have you ever felt? Uh, I'm just going to do a little follow-up question here with you about, you know, as far as leveling the playing field. I mean, I mean, are there any examples that you've come across where um, a brokerage technology investment was, you know, undermined you know, by, uh, you know, something that the, uh, you know, that the board decided to introduce? Or sure, I mean you. As a Keller Williams uh, brokerage, there are a number of tools that are provided from the international, at, from Austin, Texas, that are, that are provided to the local brokerages. One example would be just the relationship that Keller Williams has with Dot Loop, so a transaction management software. But, the Keller, but our office, through the association, opted to use the technology that was provided by the association through the transaction desk, desk software. And I, I think that happened because once you're using something and you have 200 or 300 members that are comfortable with a software, it's very difficult to make a switch, no matter who raises the bar for your brokerage, because adoption is a whole different discussion that you know, we, we only have 15% or 18% of agents that adopt a certain technology that raises the bar. Is that really raising the bar at all? Well, I know that's an interesting segue uh, to Mr. Errol Samuelson here. Errol, I, you know, I guess you guys are now uh, offering dot loop, and uh, I guess this is probably the first thing that Zillow's really you know, gone directly to the MLSs now with and has been looking to offer through a channel through the MLS as opposed to going broker by broker. And I'm just uh, would be interested sort of on, on your perspective on sort of raising the bar and you know, trying to work through the MLS as a channel on some of these tools. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think when we think about raising the bar, we take a step back and say, well, well, why raise the bar? So for whose benefit? And ultimately, it's for the benefit of the home buyer and the home seller. And so if we look at services that can make that experience for the consumer better, uh, more seamless, more efficient, then I think that's an area where it does make sense to try and provide a service uh, universally. And I think transaction management, is, a, in the case of Dot Loop, is a good example of that. Um, you know, if you think about uh, services that we get from local government, uh, we don't have our own private security forces. There's a, there's a common police force and there's a uh, common water system and so on. And I think there, if you look at raising the bar at the MLS, 
The question, I think two questions I would ask myself is number one, is this a service that is universally needed? Uh, and if so, that would be a, a good criteria potentially for introducing that service. And I think the other criteria would be, are there network effects? So in the case of transaction management, if I have everybody working on the same platform, there are network effects. The more people using the same software, the easier it is to exchange documents or e-signatures, um, the better off everybody is. So I think there's, there's a really strong argument for providing certain universal services that, that are of common interest, of common need, and universally benefit, benefit everyone. Conversely, I think there's some areas where large brokerages with their scale, perhaps with their in-house IT groups, are able to innovate um, and I think they can find it frustrating when they make significant investments. I mean, mobile would be an example. Uh, some brokers with the means put big investments in mobile early on. Uh, then perhaps to later see uh, similar technology provided even to one and two and three person shops. Um, I would also say it's probably the nature of technology. It's a bit of an arms race. If you get an edge, it's usually an edge that maybe lasts one, two, three years uh, before the rest of the market catches up or sometimes maybe as little as three weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. on. We had the great QR code battle there a couple of years ago where it seemed like suddenly everybody was racing to see who could do the most innovative QR code implementation, but I guess uh, mercifully that seems to have passed us by now. And, and now Marty is, a, is a, a vendor of MLS systems with Black Knight. I mean, you guys have a flexible bundle of services that you offer, and when you're working with an MLS, uh, customer, I mean, they can sort of customize and tailor your offering. How do you see this play out in the, in the marketplace as far as, you know, people trying to raise the bar by adjusting their, uh, you know, their MLS bundle that they're procuring from you guys? Well, I think uh, brokers and agents are always looking at ways that they can differentiate themselves in the marketplace. I think our challenge is a little bit different in that we do have to, in order to create economies of scale and cost efficiencies, bundle things within a group of services that we would provide. So in order to do that, uh, then you start talking about site licensing. And then it becomes, uh, is it a menu of service or is it something that's provided as part of the service as a whole? So our challenge is to make sure that it's cost effective, but also that uh, it allows the brokers and agents to differentiate within the MLS platform. And that's why, you know, customization in, in the products and services that we uh, develop is really key. Okay, uh, I guess I'm going to go ahead and come back to Lauren and Tom on this next question, and that is the whole notion of leveling the playing field. I mean, you know, anytime you're really trying to put on an athletic competition, there is the whole notion that, hey, it should be a level playing field. You know, but it seems sort of odd that in our industry, you know, leveling the playing field has taken on you know, negative connotations. And I guess uh, really question to the MLS professional here, Lauren, we'll let you take the first crack at it. I mean, do you see some efforts to raise the bar really encroaching on the domain of the broker? I mean, have you had some serious pushback on that? Or? I wanted to contrast with what Tom said, just so you get the lay of the land, because this is an interesting mix, that we do not have a dominant broker or brokerage. Um, it, there are probably 10 different companies that would make up the top. So we're not answering to any dominant players. Um, one of my joking comments about being on this panel was, if this is the last time that we can talk about leveling the playing field, I'll be on it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do, do we drop the I mean, down? really. I, I guess what I look at is commercial enterprises. I don't want to speak for Errol or Zillow. I don't want to speak for Keller Williams, but I'm going to guess that they don't sit in the boardroom and worry about leveling the playing field. I mean, give me a break. I, I um, Am I answering the question? I guess, um, have we encroached? Even though we don't have a dominant, a dominant player, we certainly are in touch with not only through our leadership, but also we reach out to our larger offices, larger brokers, more influential players in the market. It, it's about customer service. It's about knowing what your customers need. And, and I think Errol's point, yeah, I sort of had an aha moment of, isn't it interesting that his customer is the consumer? 
and ours is at arm's length with that, but it's about what's going to make their job easier, and yet that trickles down into the people that we serve directly, the brokerage and appraisal community. Did I answer that question, or should I go on? Well, I mean, I like the part that I'm hoping this is the last session that we have about uh, leveling the playing field. I do field. have one other thing, and, and I guess this is the part of the leveling the playing field that troubles me, is that I think too often we can be tempted to therefore serve the lowest common denominator, and that drives me nuts. I, I think that's where we can truly raise up. I love it when you guys applaud. This is kind of addictive. I like it. Well, I don't know, Tom, do you have a, a follow-up there? I mean, the whole notion that maybe uh, trying to service the lowest common denominator is maybe cutting back in that area might be one way to really raise the bar a little bit, not cater so much to the, the brand new newbie. I, I agree. I mean, uh, MLSs, by their nature, are a marketplace of competitors who do come together yet agree to a common set of rules on how they're going to compete with each other and also cooperate on transactions, not dissimilar to investment banks and firms on Wall Street or the NASDAQ. So you can't, so all the participants care that there's some field of play that has basic yeah. rules. Now, they will ebb and flow, there will be cheaters, there will be people who deflate the footballs, you know, whatever it takes in order to win. <laughs> And then you make up a new rule, and they get an auto fine. They pay their 50 bucks, and they move on. Um, but on the uh, a little more serious note, though, when we look at things like web pages and IDX and mobile tools um, in our market, we looked at some products a few years ago when mobile apps were starting to come strong. We were in the Great Recession. We looked at electronic signatures, and we weren't sure we wanted to justify an investment for uh, like an enterprise or a site license for all the agents in this field. But we went to the brokerage firms and said, hey, here's an opportunity where we've got some cool products. This is going to help all of your firms compete in the marketplace in a marketplace that's become even more competitive when there was the market was going down. Um, what do you think about going in this direction? And they said, yeah, so let's try something new. And we did actually create a, a fee for service model on a few products and services. and within an incredibly short period of time, we had a 15 to 25% adoption on a few products that was really quite surprising to us. And at those levels, you can start to financially do the numbers and justify site licenses and providing services. So that is an example of the rules of the game didn't really change, but the services provided did, and it was in a way where we could actually raise the playing field for all of the members. What's nice about some of those opportunities, and Marty talked about, um, customizing, and I sort of wonder why vendors or suppliers in the industry don't think a little bit more about this. Um, products, you know, we're not going to compete in the technology world. We don't have the financial resources or the technical chops of a Zillow or some of the other providers, but they probably have the chops not only to make great products that are universally deployable, but could also be selectively customizable to represent someone who wants to pay the extra nickel to brand it differently, to get a different feature. And so I like looking for opportunities like that, and I think most of the firms would recognize that if I still get that much of an advantage over my competitor, first of all, am I smart enough to adopt a product and train my agents to use the product? And oh, by the way, if I can customize it or get it you know, white labeled to my brand, then that makes me stand out in the consumer's mind as well. So I, I sort of appreciate the consumer perspective from Zillow and the challenges that a vendor would have in order to deploy a product that could be universally adopted. So that's how we kind of look at it. I see that this ultimately the economies of scale of really being able to work with a, a product, you know, at an MLS scale where you're signing up thousands of people in a crack really, you know, make those sorts of things possible that they wouldn't be if you're trying to sell something broker by broker, right. agent by agent. I guess that kind of brings us back around to our, our vendor representatives here. I mean, because you guys both have products and services that you can sell into the MLS channel, as well as possibly unbundle them and offer them individually to, to brokers and agents. You know, you know, what's some of the thought processes about you know, how you decide whether or not to, uh, you know, to try to sell something through the MLS, or are you better off going ahead and working with just a couple of large brokers, or really trying to identify top producing, you know, dare I say, premier agents? Uh, you know, here, Errol, why don't you take first crack at that? Again, I think it, it depends on, is it a service that 
um, is, is needed by all, it's, it's almost like a basic service, or is it a, an area where it's of interest to specific agents or teams or brokerages and not necessarily uh, valuable to everybody? Um, I, I think that's the criteria. I, I think the thing that kind of I find frustrating is that a lot of times, you know, there's areas where we don't have commonality or standards, and these really aren't areas where brokerages need to compete with each other. I, I'll give you the example of data standards. Uh, you know, not only within the MLS, but across MLSs, it makes no sense that we still are struggling with um, different data formats and different ways to access data, and in some cases, um, sort of arcane rules or fees, so the brokers and the agents are paying dues, but then they also have to pay an additional fee to get their own data back. And I, and I think that that kind of a, an atmosphere actually leads to the broker angst that sometimes creates the friction between the brokerage community and the MLSs, and, and it's unnecessary. It's like, you know, you go to Europe and you, you carry this bag of 15 different converters so you can plug your razor in, and by the way, you better make sure the wall doesn't say it's 240 volts, because even with the right plug, you're going you're gonna to burn your razor. And so, uh, we, I, I really think we need a greater focus on standards that are implementable. Um, and really, that's not where we need to compete in the brokerage community. I, I think there's a lot of inefficiencies that are self-imposed, self-inflicted. And if we could eliminate some of those, then the brokerages can compete on the things that really matter, which is around you know, recruiting or having systems or providing support to their agents or coaching or marketing programs. Those are the areas I think the brokerages can compete with each other, not on um, can I access the data more efficiently than my competitor. So, yeah. I don't know, Marty, how do you all decide whether or not to try to sell individually or really focus on doing it either through the MLS or not at all? Well, at Black Knight, we've taken a hard look at uh, everything that we invest in with regards to our MLS platforms. And we realized over the course of time that it's not a good position to try to be all things to all people. So there's areas of the application that we feel like are universally beneficial to everyone. And search, for example, everybody needs that. So you want to, you want to implement things that move the search features along. But when you look at other um, services that now there are so many third parties offering in the marketplace, we're taking a strategy of partnering with the best of the best in terms of offering those services. Um, because when you implement uh, another service within the MLS platform, you've got to support that service, you've got to maintain that service, and it's not something you get up and eat, sleep, and drink every day, but the core aspects of the MLS you do. So when you partner with someone else uh, to, to leverage what they offer and what they do get up every day implementing, uh, then I think we, we provide better services across the board to our MLS customers who in turn can then offer those services as they see fit within their organizations. Okay, well, now that's kind of interesting that both yours and Errol's uh, comments really kind of ended up talking about data access. And, uh, and there is a, you know, a larger world of potential users, uh, particularly developers, app developers, uh, you know, young startups out there that really you know, have got cool ideas, but uh, again, it's difficult for them to really try to deal with, you know, working with dozens or a hundred or more MLSs, each with different policies and procedures. I guess when we talk about trying to you know, really change the mix of services that are available out there, you know, rather than the MLS having to do everything, there is the possibility of the MLS really adopting more progressive data access policies, or, or not, and, uh, and determining how that might play out. I, I don't know, why don't we just kind of go straight down the line and talk about data access policies. How are those you know, you know, raising the bar, you know, leveling the playing field. Here, Errol. Sure. Uh, so, so if you're building software for agents um, or, or brokerages, it, it, it can be really difficult for small vendors to, to break into the market. I, I might build a beautiful application in Houston, and uh, the membership loves it, and then I decide I want to go next door to the neighboring MLS, and it's a different license agreement, it's different data formats, and by the time I get it rolled out even to the top 100 MLSs, I've probably spent a couple of million dollars just to have the ability to sell my product nationwide. And so for this, this, this barrier is, I believe, preventing innovation in this industry. And I really think that there's a partnership here with, with the MLSs and, and vendors such as ourselves or Black Knight. There's an opportunity to really create an ecosystem that is, that is you're not giving up data rights, you're not giving up copyright, you're protecting your data. 
but you're enabling innovation. And that, with, it, with, the, with, a, with an ecosystem where it's easy for a developer or a brokerage to create new solutions, then you really are raising the bar and you're enabling competition. I mean, it's the whole reason um, we have the Retsley business is to create a very simple environment where the MLS can control their data, but lots of smart, innovative developers can go build great applications. There, there's a real, I think there's a real dearth. There's some great software in this industry, but I think there's a real dearth of innovation compared with other industries. And I think the MLSs can really be at the, at, be the hub, be the center of that innovation if they can create the software, software environment, uh, create this ecosystem. And, and so, in other words, I mean, opening up data access is the key to trying to get this ecosystem to come into its own. I, I think providing platforms which enable managed data access, but common formats, uh, software, software tools that make it easy for developers to incorporate MLS data in their products, albeit in a way that the MLS has control. Okay. Well, Marty's Black Knight working on the problem? That's a well, I think we work on the problem every single day. Um, I can't count the number of calls I might get in a week's time from third-party vendors who say, hey, I've developed this product and I've sold it to broker XYZ in this particular marketplace and uh, you're the vendor for the MLS in there. How do I get the consolidated list of data? Well, first of all, you don't get it from us. You get it from the MLS. And then you have to explain the policies of, or try to explain that every MLS has a different policy with regards to data licensing and that you need to contact the MLS. But in order for me to do that, the argument comes back, I've got to do this individually for every single MLS that I want to break my product out in the marketplace. Yes, that's true. And that's the way it works today. Um, and then on the flip side of that, we have multiple ways in which we provide data uh, on behalf of the MLSs to all of the vendors out there. And uh, surprisingly enough, we're still trying to get rid of FTP. Um, so when we sit up here and talk about standards and RETs and everybody going the same way, uh, the marketplace isn't uh, moving everybody in that direction very fast in some respects with regards to the vendors that need access to data through the MLSs and the means in which they can actually receive that data. Now, Tom, do you still offer an FTP feed? <laughs> it is our vendor's favorite methodology for collecting data. <laughs> Uh, 140 of our 160 vendors that use data from Northwest MLS use an FTP feed. Wow. And they have asked us to continue it. Uh, so I'm sure that will evolve when there's really one standard, but they don't want to build their version of whatever the RETS standard is at the time. Uh, I don't worry that much about it. As long as we have enabled RETS and FTP, they have their choice of however they want to get to the data. So that's really not a challenge for us. The challenge for us has always been at, at what point is it appropriate for Northwest MLS to license all of the listing data for its members to any party or third party to do what they want to do with it. And so we are really um, very conservative in licensing our data. So we don't have a syndication arrangement with anybody, and the Northwest MLS does not syndicate any broker's data to any publisher. Uh, the brokers who want to syndicate their data can syndicate their own. And that discussion has gone on for years, and it always comes down to a close vote. Uh, you know, it's like uh, the photo finish. Is it going to pass or fail? But it's been consistently... Um, why would we marginalize ourselves and the MLS by giving all of our data to somebody else who's going to monetize it and then sell it back to us? And that's kind of been their general feeling about the data. And I guess it will stay that way for a while. Okay, well, I know Lauren, everything's going with you. The whole data access policy front. Have you all been uh, breaking any new trail there, restful APIs for the young kids to work with? Or? What occurs to me, I, I guess my misconception our data access license agreement, which was probably crafted, I'm going to guess, 10 years ago. I thought it would be a static document, and I thought it, that it would be a pigeonhole situation of here's company A and they fit under section one, and here's company B and they fit over here. And I kid you not, no exaggeration, I would say every other week we have a new twist on the requests or the company or the business model where we have to kind of sit back and go, well, can they do that? Like, 
But the other thing that I'm thinking, because the MLS is caught in the middle of the broker saying protect our data. We're not supposed to use that word, I know, but protect our information, protect our listings. And then yet on the other hand, they're saying give us my information or give us all of the information so we can go do what we want to do. So we have this interesting balancing act that we have to constantly address. What occurs to me is wouldn't it be interesting if we could either on a local level or perhaps even a national level have a staging site where these developers could go and have at it, have some fun, innovate, create, and, and come back to us with what you have. And I understand our structures are different, but um, maybe that's something on a local level that each of us should consider doing. Because we truly believe, as Tom said as well, we don't send the information anywhere that the broker doesn't tell us to send it. So we would have to, I don't know, change a digit and everything or give them old information or whatever it is so that it isn't active uh, and comparable information today. So we're thinking like maybe try to set up some, set up some sort of a national sample database that uh, well, you know, talk, developers could it? try to work with and, yeah, and that really. way you wouldn't be constantly having people hitting you up for a uh, well, or little samples or a taste here and there. You know, part of the reason that we're here is to exchange ideas. And, and if that interests anybody, let's start the conversation about that. Maybe it makes sense. We certainly have the tools behind or beside us to do it, be it Retsley, Sparks, Trestle. There are lots of ways that the information could be made available. So maybe what we need to do is now give them a playground. Um. Now, ultimately, here I'm going to have the next question come all the way back down the line the other way here, starting with you, David. And, and that really is that you know, MLS is, we have our members asking us to really offer them the tools and services so they don't really need to go out you know, and, and spend a lot of money or expose themselves to you know, other premium services like, hey, why can't the MLS do this for me? And there have been you know, a couple of areas where, in particular, as far as like really wanting to raise the bar, you know, we had a, a group of very influential brokers and agents that really came to HAR and wanted us to work on, on a rating system. And it was you know, you know, very controversial at the time, but again, the whole notion of, of really trying to go ahead and, and, and raise the bar there. And that was something that, uh, uh, again, you know, was a subject of great debate as to whether or not we should do the, the ratings and how they should work. And the, the other one is on MLS public websites, you know, offering those. And again, that's really where the, the whole leveling the playing field chorus um, you know, got, got pretty loud and it still is, you know, something that is, you know, debated and is, you know, taking, a, you know, some new forms now with the broker public portal and such. But as you really think back over the course of the last, you know, again with the case of agent ratings, it's been like five or six years. In the case of an MLS public website, it goes back to Y2K. I mean, you know, has the debate that's been going on for so long in our industry about these types of services and the whole discussion about, you know, you know, raising and leveling and what have you. I mean, has that created an opportunity that's really, you know, brought other third parties into the industry in a way that's maybe weakened the MLS? And I guess just starting from a broker's perspective. Uh, what do you think, Dave? Well, I think that there's, there's a set number, at least today, there's a set number of tools that are out there. So let's look at, like, the rating system, which has been around for years, but now is just starting to really make its way into the industry and, and become commonplace. That, that's something that I think is coming. I would believe that it would be better for members, brokers, and associations had the association or the whatever that entity is would get involved and help shape that uh, tool or how that tool plays out. Left to uh, certain things left to just the free enterprise system or allowing these third party vendors to come in may, may not always be realtor friendly. And, and I think that's something that has to be weighed when associations look at mm -hmm. these kind of technology tools and whether they need to be involved in, not from a leveling the playing field perspective, but just having a, an element of control in that process may be better for the, for the brokerages and members in the long run. That's true. I mean, the harder you row, the better you can steer the boat. So, uh, oh, Lauren, uh, you know, what do you think about the sort of the delay that we've imposed on ourselves as an industry with this ongoing debate? You know, is it 
Avis. I think sometimes we get paralyzed by even the notion of change or an improvement. And what excites me in the industry is when we see what I call leapfrog technology, that if our MLS offers a two-star product, whatever it is, and then Tom comes over with a five-star, and then Marty goes with a 10-star, and it's like, yes. And then we can then learn from what they do. I, um, with, with the public site, we're one of the fortunate MLSs that we launched in 1998, so pre-Y2K. I didn't realize that that was on the mark, but uh, it has been very successful and based on the studies that uh, consumers appreciate the consumer, I mean the uh, Switzerland site. We don't have any ads. We follow fair display guidelines. Um, we have no promotion of of agents or listings. It's just you, you search for what you receive. So I, I think it, it's also a lesson in kind of back to the relationship with your customers and making sure that they understand, in the case of the public site, that we're their marketing co-partner. We're not trying to, to knock Cobalt Banker, Remax, XYZ, anybody out of out of the top position, but the fact of the matter is if we weren't where we are, someone else would fill it. It would create a void and chances are good to excellent that they would pay for it. So um, we have a good relationship right now with that, which is great. Okay, so you speak of a void. I don't know. <laughs> here, Tom, so take us in. Let us stare into the void. So here. I get to fill the void? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think the industry, because it's so fractionalized, uh, not only have we seen tremendous evolution where, you know, maybe it's good news we're down to 700 MLSs from 1,200 or whatever the number was. There's a number of other things that have happened that I think are dramatic in the industry, though. 25 years ago, most of real estate uh, was not managed by publicly traded or owned organizations. And today, um, when you look at the large brands, and you look at the largest suppliers and vendors in the space, they are owned and operated by publicly owned and traded companies which have quarterly reports and dividends to pay and shareholders to respond to. And technology's pace of evolution since 20 some years ago of the creation of the web is continuing to increase at an increasing rate. So I think it makes it hard for an industry that has traditionally been very uh, sort of fractured and fractionalized to sort of in unison respond in some way mm -hmm. that is uh, supportive and in a way that we agree to go in the same direction at the same time. I think that by its own nature is an environmental uh, constraint of why, did, why are these, why are there voids? Um, I think a great example was, you know, I think the industry got a little bit complacent when Realtor.com sort of survived the Y2K era Microsoft Home Advisor went away, Cyber Home sort of stalled, and there was this hmm. sort of quiet period. And in the meantime, Zillow, Trulia, and a number of other companies were starting up in even a more uh, modern era of technology and sort of lessons learned in business planning. And their growth and adoption was dramatic, and at some point kind of poo-pooed, like, oh, who would care about you know, AVMs or the value of your neighbor's home? And that bought enough time to build some really interesting and dynamic technology and, a, and an organization that's very strong. So um, we've also gone from many newspapers in cities to one newspaper towns to now we have one newspaper for real estate mm -hmm. for less than a handful. And so where brokers used to complain 20 years ago, geez, we all have to put our ads in the local paper to compete with the other broker who's putting ads in the paper. Now we're chasing each other to get our premier broker or agent on a handful of websites. So the dynamic is different, and I think the idea of a unified sort of approach, which I think the brokerage community felt there was a void, and I think that's why we're hearing about things like Upstream and Broker Public Portal, because that's their reaction to our MLS and organized real estate structures inability to move fast enough. Um, oh, I'm not sure how to fix that, other than if we just Throwing the towel, 
Well, I think from a lot of people's perspective, it's not a problem to be fixed. Uh, but, uh, there you go. You do make a good point, though, about you know capital coming into the marketplace. Uh, you know, Marty, BKFS is publicly traded. Uh, you know, how is a uh, how are you guys capitalizing on, or what do you guys think about sort of the you know the opportunity that the MLSs have created because of the areas that they've stayed out of? Are there Black Knight programs that are specifically targeting some of the areas that the MLSs have avoided? Or well, I think when, uh, at least speaking from my perspective, we try to do things that help the MLS to be more progressive in their space. Uh, for example, in addressing like broker public portal or ideas like that, um, we've taken the system to a different level in providing services that allow the MLS to then in turn provide things that differentiate the brokers and the agents, for example. And in doing so, in the MLS that they use every single day, they're not having to learn a new technology, but they're able to brand and communicate and facilitate everything that they want to do that initiatives like Broker Public Portal, for example, would allow them to do. Now they can do that today in their home MLS system, but do it in a manner and a, a way in which they are providing that service directly, not that it's MLS specifically branded. No, Errol, give us the last word on it. Uh, let me speak to ratings, agent ratings, is what you mentioned a minute ago. Uh, th there's probably some interesting takeaways from that. I think everybody knew that there were going to be agent ratings. When consumers are going online to, on Amazon and seeing ratings for everything from a book to a $50 toaster, the consumers are going to want to have ratings for something as important as the person working with them in the real estate transaction. So I think there was a certain inevitability about it. And so sometimes I think we need to find a way to embrace what the consumers want even when that's uncomfortable. And there's a way usually to do it in an industry-friendly manner. But I think the other piece that you were speaking about, which is access to capital and scale, um, to do ratings right, uh, I mean, I'll give you an example. We have human moderators who read every rating, review it. If they look you know, questionable, we throw them out. We have uh, artificial intelligence software which tries to flag you know, bad, bad reviews and so on. Uh, and so it does help to have scale. So I think the MLS is one of the few groups in the industry which has scale. And certainly the group of MLSs here have scale. And I think there's a lot of things that as a community, um, the MLSs can do to benefit the members, benefit consumers. And that's not necessarily um, leveling the playing field. I think that is addressing the needs that the ultimate end user, the ultimate customer uh, has. Okay, well, Errol, Marty, Tom, Lauren, David, thank you guys so much for coming on out and uh, sharing your thoughts on uh, the subject. And again, Lauren, I promise this is the last time ever that anyone will talk about leveling the playing really? field or raising the bar. So uh, we're going to hear a big round of, for, of applause for our, our panelists here today. And uh, thank you all very much. <laughs>